Hey YouTubers, this is the Gold Standard Zero 924 coming at you with Chapter 6 in my Wrestling Reimagining series for WWE 2006. Today I'll be covering the SmackDown May pay-per-view event Judgment Day. Now, Judgment Day had an actually pretty good undercard, I'll admit. And while the undercard was very enjoyable for the most part, then you get to the main event matches that were featured on the show. In the main event, you had Rey Mysterio defending his World Heavyweight title belt against JBL. The Undertaker taking on The Great Khali in his pay-per-view debut. And Kurt Angle rekindling his feud against Mark Henry, which Mark Henry won as a result of Countout. Now... I think that Judgment Day could have been a potentially a really tremendous pay-per-view next to No Way Out that year had the main event matches delivered for the most part, had the main event matches kind of felt kind of like... It just really felt to be a little more to be desired in ways. I mean, you had Grey Kali, he was coming in at this time. And this isn't a knock on Kali per se, but he's one of those wrestlers that I really... Like, I wasn't really sure what to do with him throughout the course of this fantasy booking. I mean, he's a very tall dude, and very unique and gigantic for his size. But when it's all said and done, I was just unsure how I was going to book Great Khali throughout the course of 2006. I mean, he had this big feud that he had against The Undertaker throughout the summer. And then once he finished his feud with The Undertaker, he kind of floundered for a bit, and then they started pushing him back up again in 2007, you know, he even won the World Heavyweight title, but it was just very difficult of me to really figure out a way how to keep Great Khali relevant, and unfortunately, I just, looking at the description box down below where I basically book uh, the matches that I would rebook for this pay-per-view, but I just wasn't able to secure a spot for him, unfortunately. But once you have Greg Kali feuding with guys that are his size, I mean, what competition does Greg Kali have left in store for? I mean, for a you know for a guy that big, I mean, what what do you do with uh, the Greg Kali in that situation? That was a question that I had to ask myself when I was in the process of booking this pay-per-view. And unfortunately, I just was not able to present Greg Kali in a much bigger presence like he had in reality. But rambling aside, I'm just going to kind of kick things off by booking Judgment Day and... The first two pay-per-view matches that they had on here consist of the tag team title belt between Eminem defending the belts against Brian Kendrick and Paul London, and another match between Chris Benoit and Finley. Those particular two matches I would actually keep from the actual pay-per-view events. I thought that they were handled really well. Uh, the tag team title belt was the first match of the night. Eminem defending the belts against, like I said, Kendrick and London. And in this case, I'd rather call them the Hooligans, which I think that was the tag team name that uh, Kendrick and London were hoping to go under by this time, as far as figuring out a name for their tag team. But around this time, they had like Kendrick and London. They were always coming out to this entrance. They were wearing these creepy masks that they would wear, and to kind of symbolize the emphasis on their partnership. Now, I would definitely keep this match, like I said, when rebook a whole lot as far as how the match flowing will go, but I wouldn't necessarily have Eminem lose a shitload of matches like they did in reality, because in the weeks leading into Judgment Day, they had Mercury and Nitro just jobbing the hell out of Brian Kendrick and Paul London, whether if it was a tag team match, whether it was individual singles matches, but... I wouldn't necessarily have them job out that badly, per se. I mean, the match that they, the SmackDown that they had at the WrestleMania, the match that they had was just so amazing. And when 
Kendrick and London won against Eminem, it was like a really huge deal at the time. And granted, it was a non-title match, but you kind of get the impression that Brian Kendrick and Paul London would automatically be the number one contenders for the tag team title belts. And we could set it up just like that. And Eminem would have their fair share of victories just to show that they aren't completely on a downward spiral per se, but just to show that they still have it, even though Brian Kendrick, Paul London might have received the winning advantage, but Mercury and Nitro still have some gas left in their tank. So we have the tag team title belt underway. And the hooligans are going to go over Eminem just like how they did in reality. I was hoping not to split up Eminem at this time. But when the more I started to look into these dirt sheets as to the reason why Mercury and Nitro ended up splitting a lot sooner than they did. If I'm not mistaken, I was reading up the dirt sheets that there was some heated animosity between Mercury and Nitro at this time. I think Johnny Nitro, Molina, their attitudes towards the SmackDown roster. Like, there was some disintegration going on between Mercury and Nitro. Johnny Nitro and Molina end up turning on Joey Mercury. There was some brawling going on after the match. You know, Johnny Nitro and Molina uh, went up to Teddy Long, and they basically got into, like, a physical altercation, getting to the point where Teddy Long, as the SmackDown general manager, ends up firing both Molina and Johnny Nitro. <laughs> Nitro and Molina ended up going to Raw not long after this. And I was thinking that they were going to do like a follow-up feud between Mercury and Nitro, but uh, the, uh, fortunately that was not the case, as it seemed like the direction that they would have went. Joe Mercury took time off throughout the summer to go to rehab. So unfortunately, I was not able to continue the Eminem tag team which may be out of my control just based on the behind-the-scenes circumstances. Nevertheless, Brian Kendrick and Paul London end up winning the tag team titles. Uh, they were very hot at this time, so I think that would, either way, however you want to look at it, I think you know Kendrick and London uh, was the right decision to put the belts on them. Now, Benoit and Finley, like I discussed, I would keep this match here. Probably tweak the feud a little bit differently. Uh, basically, around this time, you had, I think his name was Brent Albright, who was a wrestler from the developmental of OVW, and they brought him in the SmackDown after WrestleMania. And what we would do here is that Fit Finley would have a match against Brent Albright. Finley would completely decimate Brent Albright, and basically, after the match, he continues the assault on the new wrestler. Chris Van Wall comes out to make the save and takes Brent Albright under his wing as sort of a mentor-student dynamic that we would have. Ben Wall doesn't take too keenly on Finley, you know, saying that he loves to fight, but he doesn't realize that when it comes to Chris Ben Wall, the rabbit Wolverine, he is a man that you ought to teach respect. And he hopes to get into Finley's head by showing him what sportsmanship really is. That he, that you know, especially with Finley, because he has that signature shillelagh that you always utilize during a match, and that you know, even though he likes to fight, it also comes at the expense of him, you know, using underhanded tactics in order to get his way. And Benoit just doesn't like the way that Finley. As far as his mentality, because he, you know, can't even win a clean fight, you know, but, and that's kind of the theme that will set up this match here at Judgment Day. And I would actually change the finish, because Ben Wall was taking time off a little after this, went on his five-month sabbatical. Now, i assuming that WWE knew in advance that Ben Wall would take time off. I would change the finish, and Finley's going to go over Chris Van Wall instead. You utilize Finley, try to really present him as a potential strong heel that definitely SmackDown needed at this time. I definitely really enjoy Fit Finley's run in 2006. Definitely underrated uh, return in wrestling. I would have Finley go over Chris Van Wall, like I mentioned. 
Next up we have is the United States Championship belt up for grabs. Rey Mysterio will put his belt up against William Regal. Now there isn't necessarily too much build up per se. Now Rey Mysterio won the US title belt from Chris Van Wall in an Eddie Guerrero tribute match at WrestleMania. Regal gladly admires the world, especially America, reminding that if he hadn't had as much success wrestling in the States, he wouldn't be the superstar that he is today and will stop at nothing to come out of the match with gold in his hands. And Rey Mysterio is going to go over William Regal to retain the U.S. Championship in a TV-style match. It wouldn't necessarily be too long, but at least reasonable and enough where Mysterio and Regal could get enough time to really do what they can. And uh, Mysterio is going to come out on top, really trying to cement Mysterio as a strong fighting champion possible. The career-threatening hardcore match. And this is going to be about between Matt Hardy and JBL. Now, how all this stems is that around this time, they brought back the King of the Ring tournament. And Matt Hardy and JBL would be two of those competitors competing in that particular tournament and they ended up eliminating each other due to a double disqualification of sorts that causes both men to automatically be disqualified from the tournament now in the weeks leading up into the judgment day Bradshaw has stressed out numerous promos that going to 2006 that he's just been having a very terrible year. You know, I mean, at one point in time, he had been the face of SmackDown, holding the WWE Championship longer than any competitor that has stood up to him at this point. And to see him fall from grace, he looked himself through the mirror, wondering if he's still deserving of going by the name or the moniker as the wrestling god that he claims that he is. On the other side, Matt Hardy has claimed to be on limbo since being booted off from Raw to SmackDown months prior. He acknowledges the fan support despite the harsh times that he's been going through. From his girlfriend cheating on him and getting fired from his job only for the company to rehire Matt Hardy, he thanks his fans for being the reason why he is in this ring doing what he loves to do. However, Bradshaw feels that SmackDown is too big for the both of them. Even going as far as providing a stipulation shall one of them lose at Judgment Day, they will be forced to retire from in-ring competition. So based on the circumstances surrounding the King of the Ring encounter, Matt and Bradshaw agreed to settle their dispute, not just in a traditional match, but in a no-disqualification hardcore match, to determine a clear winner. Now, Jillian Hall was also JBL's business manager, and after what happened at WrestleMania, coming up short against Ric Flair in an interpromotional match, Bradshaw ends up firing Jillian Hall, claiming her to be a liability, and Jillian Hall is burst into tears. And that will play a part during the match where Jillian Hall would come out, interfere in the match, looking like she's going to help JBL, but maybe that they possibly are back on good terms again. Just kind of tease the audience into thinking that Jillian and JBL managed to make amends and that you might have some sort of feeling that perhaps Bradshaw didn't mean the things he said to her, but... Jillian Hall just ends up refusing to help Bradshaw, backing down the apron. Matt Hardy takes advantage, ends up using the twist of fate on JBL to get the cover. One, two, three for Matt Hardy to end up going over against JBL. There's going to be a lot of uh, weapons also in this match, hence being a hardcore match. I'm trying to come up with a spot that people are going to remember. And... One of the spots I could imagine them doing is where Matt Hardy tries to go for his signature leg drop on JBL 30 announce table, which would be the oh my god moment of the match. But they're definitely going to use a lot of weapons going in this match, whether it's kendo sticks, steel chairs, steel trays, 
nightsticks if need be, but whatever the case they could be, like even a ring bell, but all those sorts of objects that you expect in a hardcore match, uh, garbage disposal, garbage bins. But Matt Hardy's going to go over Bradshaw, and because Bradshaw was contemplating on retirement at this point, uh, so Matt Hardy's going to go over JBL and use this as a way to kind of rejuvenate some of the momen momentum that Matt Hardy lost since coming over to SmackDown. We try to present him as a potential key important star of the show. So that's the career-threatening hardcore match. So what we're going to have is a Cruiserweight Open match for the Cruiserweight Championship. We are going to have Chavo Guerrero defending the belt against Psychosis, Super Crazy, Sky Tuhati, Nunzio, Funaki, Jamie Noble, and Kid Cash. Just a fun little Cruiserweight Open match, nothing too elaborate. I would have Chavo Guerrero retain the Cruiserweight Championship belt. And to really... The whole theme of it is just basically one versus all. And basically every Cruiserweight for himself. Because there can only be one wrestler holding that particular championship belt. And Chavo Guerrero is going to walk out barely surviving. And he is, like I said, still the Cruiserweight champion. Then we get to the King of the Ring finals. Booker T defending the belt against... Oops. <laughs> defending the belt. Okay, okay. It's not a championship belt, but it's a tournament. So it's the King of the Ring Finals. Booker T takes on Bobby Lashley in the final round to determine the 2006 King of the Ring winner. Now, I didn't necessarily mind them bringing back King of the Ring, but my problem behind the way that they structured the King of the Ring that year was the fact that they didn't really utilize a lot of wrestlers on their roster to feature in the tournament. Because even prior to that, you had King of the Ring tournaments where they would consist of 14, 16 competitors, primarily 16 competitors. And then in 2000, they had like 32 being the highest amount of competitors that they had. But for the sake of this booking, this would be 16 competitors. And SmackDown... I believe, you know, they, they had like a week, like a month to build up for Judgment Day. So there really was no excuse for why they shortened the King of the Ring to just having eight competitors. So I'm going to have the King of the Ring tournament be presented as a big deal. And really uh, spotlight some of these wrestlers and give them their own reason for why they should be the King of the Ring. Why they should win the tournament and what that would mean to them in the long run. That, that would be kind of how I would build up the tournament, just to have like little big, well, little promos of some of the wrestlers that are, all the wrestlers, I should say, that are competing in the tournament. Just very, sh like, little snippets of, you know, who I am, what I'm doing here in the tournament, and what I hope to gain by winning the King of the Ring. And, which brings to another uh, problem that I have with, when they with the way that they brought back King of the Ring was that the fact that it was so obvious that they used this as a way to push one wrestler. And what I mean is that they pretty much made it obvious that Booker T was going to win this King of the Ring tournament so that the winner of this match would get a personality makeover, which I wasn't I just wasn't very fond of just the purpose of them bringing back King of the Ring just to give someone a personality makeover. And they made it pretty obvious that Booker T was going to win this whole tournament and then subsequently became King Booker in the process. But I'm going to change the dynamic of the winner of the King of the Ring tournament. Sort of like what they did in 1994, 1995, and 2002 where the winner of the King of the Ring tournament would be the number one contender for the World Heavyweight Championship. And that's basically how I'm going to sell this King of the Ring and try to present it as a big deal. Not just to put over one wrestler, but to, put over, but to kind of make it seem like other competitors competing in the King of the Ring could easily benefit from it in a way where they really feel like, you know, I have to win this King of the Ring tournament. You know, this is... You know, this is going to be the first step into taking that next leap to the big leagues or something something along those lines. Like, I could be a potential big part of this 
particular SmackDown brand. Something to that effect. Now, Booker T is going to go over Bobby Lashley in this match. Booker T is going to be the King of the Ring winner, which I didn't have a problem with, but I probably would not make him into a King Booker or anything like that. That's only one thing I probably would change about his King of the Ring victory. You know, not going through a personality makeover. Now we get to the main event. The World Heavyweight Championship belt up for grabs. Kurt Angle defending the belt against The Undertaker. Now basically this is the match based on their actual encounter at No Way Out. But instead here I have it at Judgment Day. A very, I think it would be a very fitting uh very fitting, especially with Judgment Day being sort of the Undertaker show. Just the emphasis on the uh, the theme of the pay-per-view with its religious overtones. And Undertaker is, you know, in the main event against Kurt Angle. These are two of your top fan favorite wrestlers on SmackDown. Your top two baby faces. Kurt Angle managed to come out of WrestleMania, defeating Randy Orton to become the World Heavyweight Champion. It has been three years since he last held a championship belt. Tile opportunity after tile opportunity, he's came up short, but despite all the obstacles that were in his path, he managed to overcome those odds. And before you know it, WrestleMania, the grandest stage of them all, Kurt Angle got his moment and ended up walking out of WrestleMania as the new World Heavyweight Champion. Angle says that while Orton put as much effort as he could, unfortunately his methodic strategy wasn't enough to stop Kurt Angle from winning the match. And because of the circumstance in which Kurt Angle ended up breaking Randy Orton's ankle with the ankle lock, Orton fractured his ACL, and as a result of that ankle lock, he will be out of action for quite some time, or indefinitely, let's just say that. But nonetheless, the Olympian is proud to be back on the blue brand, declaring himself as the Uncle Sam that helped build SmackDown. Meanwhile, the lights fade to black, a familiar gong sound echoes the arena, filling chills down the spines of the fans in the crowd. Undertaker's music plays, the Undertaker himself comes out, confronts Kurt Angle. Taker claims that he's been the cornerstone not only for SmackDown, but WWE in general. He's seen wrestlers come and go. Undertaker reminds the Olympian that he has also had a key part into contributing to SmackDown success, and for Angle not to acknowledge Taker's contributions just really infuriates him. Uh, infuriates the Undertaker, excuse me. Deadman reminds him while Angle is the world champion, he's forgetting that SmackDown is his yard, and because of that, only one of them can claim it. Tay Long announces that Judgment Day, Kurt Angle will defend his World Heavyweight Championship against the legendary Phenom at Judgment Day in the main event. It basically plays out the same as what we saw if you, from No Way Out, and Kurt Angle is going to win the match. He's going to counter that triangle chokehold that The Undertaker had. Kurt Angle flips over into a jackknife bridge of sorts for him to retain the World Heavyweight title. Yeah, so I really love this match, and I was hoping to do it as soon as I could going into this booking. Uh, no Way Out, I wasn't able to do it. WrestleMania, which would be the most popular time to present that match on a big show. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to secure a spot for that. It's finally at Judgment Day. This is, was my big chance to do this match. It definitely would be the match of the night. And Kurt Angle would retain the world title over The Undertaker. After the match, we would have Booker T attack Kurt Angle from behind. And nails the scissors kick on Kurt Angle. Ending the show with Booker T with his foot on Kurt Angle's chest holding that Covenant World Heavyweight title belt, raising it above. So let me know what you thought about this car down in the comment section below. Stay tuned because I don't know if anyone's watched uh, the first chapter. If you refer back to when I first started this fantasy booking, I mentioned that I wasn't going to 
rebook ECW. Uh, but the next pay per view I would have I would end up doing for Chapter Seven will be the Raw pay per view event, which will be Vengeance. So just leave down your comments in the comment section below. Just tell me what your thoughts on the card. Are there some matches that you would be looking forward to? Are there some matches that that perhaps maybe you're scratching your head about? Maybe there's something that I didn't clarify per se. Feel free to leave some feedback down this, in the comment section below. And until then, this is the Gold Standard 00924 signing out.